Let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Heavenly Father, we come before your mighty throne again this Sabbath day. We praise you, Father. Father, we are not to look to the future, but each day. May it be sufficient for itself. And help us as we go through each day to live according as your son did, to your will, to do your bidding. As strangers and travelers through this world to spread this gospel. Please be with us as we open the scriptures. We pray your spirit is here with us and we keep your Sabbath holy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> I want to uh, preface what we're about to look at with this from uh, Maranatha. It's page 10. And you know, this book is out of print for the most part. And I find it interesting because it's one of her newer books, as it were, devotional-wise, because a lot of them go back to the 40s and 50s. This book was done in the 60s. 76. 76. I beg to be pardoned. But anyhow, point is, in this book are many things you cannot find anywhere else. Uh, and what does it all pertain to? Christ's second coming. Judgment. That's what we're looking at. I want to read this. The lessons of Bethlehem. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hebrews 9, 28. At the time of Christ's first advent, the priests and scribes of the holy city, to whom were entrusted the oracles of God, might have discerned the signs of the times and proclaimed the coming of the promised one. The prophecies, the prophecy of Micah designated his birthplace. Daniel specified the time of his advent. God committed these prophecies to the Jewish leaders. They were without excuse if they did not know and declare to the people that the Messiah's coming was at hand. Their ignorance was a result of sinful neglect. Beware who you follow. All the people should have been watching and waiting that they might be among the first to welcome the world's redeemer. But lo, at Bethlehem, two weary travelers from the hills of Nazareth traverse the whole length in a narrow street to the eastern extremity of the town, vainly seeking a place of rest and shelter for the night. No doors are open to receive them. There's a whole sermon just in that statement. No doors are open to receive the gospel, folks, because that's what Jesus was, wasn't it? In a shelter for the, uh, no doors were open to receive them. In a wretched hovel prepared for cattle, they at last find refuge. And there the Savior of the world is born. There is no evidence that Christ is expected and no preparation for the Prince of Life. In amazement, the celestial messenger is about to return to heaven with the shameful, shameful tidings. When he discovers a group of shepherds who are wa watching their flocks by night, and as they gaze into the starry heavens, are contemplating the prophecy of the Messiah to come to earth and longing for the advent of the world's redeemer. You see, here's another indictment to God's people. Who was talking about the prophecies? Who? Common laborers, pretty much. So they knew. There is no excuse. So they knew. And also, folks, for the Christmas thing aside, where were these shepherds? Where were they? In the field doing what? Watching their flock. It could not have been December. Absolutely not. Absol right there, the Bible's clear. It could not have been December. It was September, August, maybe October, definitely not December, because they were in the fields. They brought their herds in, just like any farmer would in harsh weather or cold weather. So here we find the common workers are discussing the coming of the Redeemer, and he's already here. Here is a company that is prepared to receive the heavenly messenger. 
And suddenly the angel of the Lord appears, declaring the good tidings of great joy. Oh, what a lesson is the wonderful story of Bethlehem. How it rebukes our unbelief, our pride and self-sufficiency. How it warns us to beware, least by our uh, criminal indifference. It's interesting she uses that word. Criminal indifference. Criminal against what law? God's law. We also fall to, fail to discern the signs at the times and therefore know not the day of our visitation. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Scripture says the Lord God will do nothing unless he reveals his secrets unto his servants. Rodney, we need to use the microphone. But no, that's okay. No, that's right. The scriptures say that he's not going to do anything unless he reveals it through his prophet. That's absolutely correct. So, you know, when we get into talking about judgment and this and, oh, well, when, you know, the Sunday law comes, then we'll know. No. What did she say it was? Criminal indifference. So, is that an indictment? Folks, we are closer to the second coming than they were to the first coming, as far as I'm concerned. You want, and you see in that little couple of paragraphs why there had to be a change in the ministry. What were the preachers and the conference presidents and all the independent people doing at that time? Were they preaching that Messiah will be here? You know, it's pretty interesting, and this is something that gets passed over too. What was taking place in Israel at the time of Christ's birth? A very, an insignificant thing or a very significant thing? very significant, and it was foretold. Pay attention, because we're there. So, it's called criminal indifference, as far as God and the Holy Spirit is concerned, to the lack of not knowing personally where we are in time. Not according to this one, not according to that one. I hear a lot of independents, they come through here. Oh, you know what they did to us at that church? Well, let me tell you something. You let them do it to you. Why? Because you did what? What'd you do? You put your faith in a man. It's that simple. It happened to me years ago, and that's when I realized I'm on my own. You put your faith in a man. You're looking for somebody to do something for you because where's your faith belong? And if you put your faith in a man about the second coming or about the judgment, what's going to happen? Next to your name is going to be written criminal indifference. That's interesting. So when you complain what somebody did to you, think what you did to yourself. Always take responsibility for your own actions. Jesus took responsibility for my actions, and that's where it led him. Because if he took responsibility for his own actions, he never would have came here. Yeah, Rodney. Well, you can't put your faith in Rodney. You can't put your faith in Paul. You can't put your faith in Bill. Nope. It's time. It's time for all of us. It's, in other words, it's me, my Bible, and Jesus. It's past time. Yes. <laughs> it's past time. And now we get people, and you know, the Bible is clear about our relationship to the government. We have, in the independence, religion built on hating the government. Every time the government's mentioned, oh, they're no good, they're no good, they're no good. You go back and you listen to Bill's tapes. Ten years ago, same groups. You listen to the questions and answers, you will hear the exact same questions. But you know what the difference is? The names of the politicians change, that's all. Peter tells us that we're not to speak evil of our government. Jesus said, render unto Caesars what is Caesars. Why? Because it becomes a religion. It becomes a focus. And all these people are amazing to me because they're the ones that tell you, oh, you shouldn't get involved in politics. But if you're running the government down 24-7, what are you involved in? Politics. At a very high level. Because it consumes you. So, at the time of Christ's first advent, were the Jews highly involved in politics? Yes. 
very highly involved. Ergo, Pontius Pilate. That's how they got him as a governor. Also, what was going on within the denomination at that time? There were insurrectionists. What were they? Who were they? Who did they fight against? Claimed to be Seventh-day Adventists, but what was their whole meaning? Goal, to destroy the Roman government. Folks, and what did they all miss? What did they miss? Willfully, it said, criminal negligence or indifference. It's the same word. You know, that's a big, you get charged with that type of thing against man's law, you're going to prison for a while. You get charged with that against God's law, you're going to lake of fire. It's that simple. And you see why there had to be a change in the way business is done on this earth and how the gospel was ministered. Because who was talking about the second coming or first coming? Who? The priests? The scribes? The lawyers? Who was talking about it? No. They were worried how they were going to get over on who? Rome. But in the back rooms, what were they doing? Making deals with the Romans to get rich. Do we see that today in our denomination? Well, we don't even bother talking about Rome anymore on a conference level. What do we do? We just go into business with them. Ergo, Adventist care services, which are under Catholic care services. Hospitals. Ho the hospitals. ADRA, which is under the Red Cross and under Catholic disaster relief, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Great controversy, done away with. I got a devotional this week. I sent some of you the picture. Sons and Daughters of God, book put out in 1955. The cover of it has, for the center of the cover, you know what it is? The center, there's people all around. Jesus is sitting towards the bottom with a, with a, with a kid on his lap. And guess who's the center of the cover? Left and right of Christ, above Christ, a priest and a nun. Folks, that says it all. That is a devotional by Ellen White. So it's okay then, and every religion mainstream is represented there in its full garb. What is it saying? They're all sons and daughters of God? Ecumenism. But the center of the picture is a Catholic priest and a nun. It says it all to me. It says it all to me. That's how, and nobody's, nobody's upset about this. Well, do away with the great controversy, and that's what you get. So we're going to continue on. And Peter, having read that, it's important because it kind of sets the stage for chapter 5 of 1 Peter. It says, the elders, verse 1, chapter 5, the elders which are among you, I exhort who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now something's interesting here that Peter points out. Because remember in the previous chapter, uh, uh, verses and chapters, Peter talks a lot about suffering and persecution, does he not? Peter points out here, I'm an elder among you, so you got to listen to me. Is that what he says? No, a witness of what? What's he saying? The sufferings of Christ. In other words, that's part of it. Because remember, he talks about in chapter 4 and chapter 3, being persecuted, suffering for the gospel, suffering for following Christ. Here Peter says, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. In other words, a witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. You're going to have to go through some problems and then the glory will be revealed. Peter saw this firsthand. Did Peter deny Christ? Uh, first Peter 5. Did Peter deny Christ? Yeah, he did. He's pointing out, I'm an elder, but yes, I know that Meekness and humility have to go with it. That's what he's talking about. Do we have leaders in the church that are meek and humble? 
not by a long shot, they consider themselves royalty, even in the independence for the most part. Their word is gospel. That's why there's a new deal. See, the law wasn't done away with. The priesthood was done away with on a formal level, so to speak. So what do they say? No, the law was done away with. So then who do you need to teach you how to live? See how it works? The first century pharisaical system was so complete, so effective, that it robbed the people of their understanding, which there's no excuse for, because it's called criminal what? Indifference of the advent of their Messiah. And as he was born in a filthy stable barn, the creator of the universe, nobody knew it. And who was talking about it? Some self-educated shepherds. And where did the blessing go? See, folks, the wise men were not there. It took them a long time to get from Persia. It took them a long time. All that stuff's Roman Catholic. It's all made up. It's all garbage. It all comes from the German Jesuit or the German... Uh, 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 Roman Catholic controlled society. You will find Christmas trees, all this stuff. Tannenbaum, you know what that is? Oh, Tannenbaum, you ever hear that? Oh, Christmas tree, that came out of German society because they were highly Ro Roman Catholic. All that stuff, the Bavarians. How many, how many popes have come from Bavaria? All Jesuit. All Bavaria is Jesuit, famous for it. So Easter, its origins are where? As we know it, Germany, you see. I'm not saying German people are bad. That's not the point. But it's a very big stronghold of Roman Catholic theology. And it's put into practice there in two world wars, actually. Adolf Hitler and Wilhelm Kaiser were backed by who? Rome. You might say, well, they were broken religion. Now, well, yeah, kind of, but not really. Yeah, Cody. Just something to add to that. And I'm not beating up on Germany either. No, but it's a fact. Yeah, but a lot of the higher criticism, in fact, almost all of the higher criticism, textual criticism, literary criticism, people not believing the Bible because, oh, Paul didn't write Hebrews, all that stuff, most of those were German uh, theologians that came up with those different criticisms. Yes. And those, the Protestants ate it all up. Yep. So now we're to the point where we think, we can't trust in the word of God because we don't know if it's truly that was the original writing or not. Yep, yep, that's right. And uh, ironically, where did Martin Luther come from? Where did the first printing press that was printing the uh, uh, English Bible come from? Gutenberg. Yep. That's interesting. It's how God does things. Okay, also uh, in Germany today, the Sunday law is already in existence. Yes. They're closed down every Sunday. In other words, what's coming here is already in Germany. And uh, from what I can gather in my research this past week, the other half of Europe is already uh, involved in it. In, in, in involved yes. in it, right. And of course, uh, global warming is everywhere. Yeah. They haven't, some of the countries haven't decided which day they want to use, but it'll eventually be Sunday. Probably. But, yeah, you're right. These are signs of the times. These are signs of the second coming of Christ. These are signs of the close of probation. You Adventists out there who think you have until the Sunday law, you better think again. I read last week where probation closes how? How do we, when does it close? There's two probations that close. Two. Which are they? You better know that. First, on whom? We read it last week. Those who call themselves Seventh-day Adventists. Revelation 11, 1 and 2. And what is the second one? Do you know that the probation is still open on the church? Does anybody know that for sure here? Can you tell me that? Do you know that it hasn't closed? Do you know that? That the ceiling hasn't begun? Because if you tell me you know that, then I'm going to tell you, the spirit of prophecy tells us what about that? You will not know when it happens. And those around you will be receiving the latter rain, and you won't even what? But we were taught, that's right, Sammy, you won't know. We were taught as Seventh-day Adventists, where will the latter rain come from? 
It's going to come on each church. That's how it was taught. Have to stay in the church. Really? Ship's got a big hole in it. Water's rushing in. You stay below decks. You go right ahead. And you will pay for that. But, you know, it's easy. You can have your cake and eat it too. It's easy. So Peter says here that an elder has to be like him. Just like that to the people. You see, all you that want to be ordained elders, you better look at that picture. Because that's what you're responsible to be. Is that humility? Do you think that is the epitome, the pinnacle of humility? It doesn't get any more humble than that, that the creator of the universe came and did what for us? And never complained once. Never said it. You know, it was the Jewish leaders that did it to me. They took all this. Did he say that? It's all, folks, it's learning. And you know what? Bring it on. Because I have to learn. I'm not asking for disaster, trust me. But I mean, the only way that God gets our attention is through what? Discipline. We seem to forget that and think we're all good. Rodney? He said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. That's humility. Yeah, it is. But you have Adventists who believe, oh, they really didn't know. They knew what they were doing. What that meant was they're casting themselves in the lake of fire. Remember, it is finished had two meanings in the Hebrew. We always forget the second one. I've condemned it in hell. We can't forget that. Either you, and Paul says, what does he say about this cross? What is it? A stumbling block to who? The Jew, he says. That would be the Seventh-day Adventist who's not following Christ, who's following leaders. Paul says a leader, or, or Peter, well, Paul says it too. But a leader has to be humble. A leader has to partake and understand Christ's sufferings. What does it mean when Peter says, I've seen his sufferings? What does it mean? When you say to somebody, what did you say, Samuel? He experienced it. Not just read it in a book. He was there. Peter cursed at his crucifixion to prove he wasn't a Christian. That's interesting, isn't it? How many Christians you know curse? What curse do you suppose he used? Thou shalt not what? What is the curse spoken of in the Bible? What is the only curse word really in the Bible? Thou shalt not what? Take the name of the Lord thy God in what? So what do you suppose Peter said? I wonder. See, that's true curse. And what is the most accepted phrase used even on primetime television today? That term. Isn't that interesting? I'm just saying. So an elder has to witness this before there's any glory. And Peter went through it, folks. We have no idea what Peter went through, but we're going to go through something similar if we stay faithful. Peter says here, of course, these words are right, right from whose mouth? Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for money, well, filthy lucre, that's not correct to say not for money, because like it says, a labor is worth his pay. Filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Let me tell you the difference between filthy lucre and your just pay. The conference, Ted Wilson took and changed the great controversy and marketed it. Book called what? The Great Hope which will get people to miss the second coming. And if it doesn't do that, it will get you thrown in the lake of fire quickly. Any money taken for that, what would you call that? Filthy lucre. Teaching that it's okay to break the commandments and being a preacher, what would you call that if you're getting paid for that? Backroom deals for pensions 
that are funded by tobacco, alcohol, porno industry. What would you call that? Do you want to pay into that system? You go right ahead. But you will be held accountable for every dollar that you pay in. Make no doubt about, uh, about it. Do you know that when the stock market tanked in, what was it, 07? You know how many preachers lost their pensions? What does Mrs. What does the Spirit of Prophecy say about investing in these things? What does it even say about partnering up with a non-Adventist in a business venture? What are we doing in business with the Catholics? Filthy lucre? Really? Is Peter talk? But folks, was it going on in his day? Yeah. Every penny that went into that temples that, that were not doing the work that those priests took, what was that? Filthy lucre. That will scream against them in judgment. You take the money for the job, you better perform the job. Because the person that's paying the money is not going to be happy. It's that simple. So Peter, but, but again, and the Bible tells us, let's not get off on a tangent here, that a labor is worth his pay. Paul talks about that, but then again, what did Paul also talk about when it came to preachers? What, did he, what else did he talk about? There was something else he talked about. Was Paul an independent preacher? You better believe it. What did he do when he went to a new city? What was one of the first things he did? He sought what? Secular employment. Did you know that? Why? He did not want anybody to say he was doing this work for what reason? For money. For money. And then Mrs. White tells us down the road that many people will become preachers and evangelists and so on because it's an easy living. They're given a house, they're given their food, they're given everything they need. And do you know, they can even adjust their income according to how much money comes in through the congregation. What was that, Maria? Even in the independents, a lot of them do it for money. Do you see why there had to be a change in the ministry? Oh, I know this is not popular, what I'm saying, and I couldn't care less. If I'm wrong, correct me. Please, I beg of you. However, you're responsible for your own judgment. And your judgment is not as formal as you think. Yes, it's explained to us in that manner. How else would we understand it? How else? How else? I don't know how heaven judges, do you? My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Is that not what God said? You know what? When I get done with this, I'm going to Jeremiah 28, 29, and 30. I strongly recommend we read that and study it. It's extremely important to the times we're in. Extreme, it talks about false prophets. It talks about coming out of captivity. Very interesting what Jeremiah says there. And you know, a lot of it in Jeremiah 29 isn't even Jeremiah talking. It's first person. So who would be talking? I, I prophetic. Who would be talking? The Lord. the Lord. As Jesus said, and don't forget, folks, because this is the way it works. It's not just unique to the book of Revelation. Revelation. Jesus said, the Father gave it to me, and I'm giving it to who? to my prophet, and he's giving it to you. That's Jeremiah 28, 29, and the whole Bible is like that. But the judgment is put in the manner it is so we can comprehend also how important it is. If you get summoned by the government, I don't know how many of you have, I've been in business over 40 years, and that happens. Whether it's state, federal, it's not something that sits well in your mind. Because these are very official, very formal. What, the more official and formal it gets, what does that mean? What would you think? Come on, Samuel, you are in a system. It's serious. Then how would you explain the investigative judgment to a 
race of people who are fearful of being called in front of the king. How would you explain it? On a very formal level. Would you not? So then, and we know they say the wheels of justice turn slowly. Is that the case with God? <laughs> not really. Because we're here uh, 6,000 some odd years. What is that in eternity? Nothing. A thousand years is as one day and one day is a thousand years. Isn't that what he said? Everything in its time. So, folks, we need to be concerned with the investigative judgment every day of our life. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. What did he say? Let the day's own evil be sufficient for the day. But we have all these plans, all this future, this future, that. It don't work that way. We can be made or broken in one second, let alone a year or whatever. Rodney? When you sin, you're already condemned. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Okay, let's continue on, because I want to get to some other things. You know, folks, we, I, I keep saying about this, I want to go to Ezekiel 8 and 9, but you see, you have to paint the full picture before you go there to understand what's going on with the leadership. If you don't understand that, if the picture... And Peter's painting a picture because did he experience it firsthand? Yes. Peter was very afraid of being captured and prosecuted and persecuted when Christ was, wasn't he? He was very afraid. That's why he said, I don't know the guy. You know. But he overcame that, and he became a powerful worker for Christ. Verse 3, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in examples to the flock. The word's in samples, but it's examples there. Now, that's interesting. Here he doubles down on the fact that you don't lord over God's heritage. That's not your job. What is your job? What was Jesus' job? Did he lord over the church? Did he come here and... Oh, yeah, he went through the temple twice, but he didn't hit anybody. Did he lord over them, or was he an example? That's why they killed him, because he was an example. They would have gladly accepted him as their lord if he'd have done what they wanted. Would they not have? Even the independents wanted him to do that, didn't they? What did Judas do, and why? And don't ever forget that Judas was the one with the money and the education. He was respected by the other 11 because of those two things. He rubbed elbows with who? The leadership. See? What got the better of Judas? Filthy lucre, would you say, Samuel? What got the better? Money, greed, position. You see why there had to be a change? And do you see why Judas could not continue? He could not. With Jesus gone, who would have kept him in check? Think about that. Peter might have stuck a sword in him, I don't know. But it would have been too late, the damage he did. Of course, Peter had a big conversion. And when he says, feed the flock, where did, you, where did Peter hear that from? Where did he hear that from? First hand. Where did he, when he was walking on the, when he was fishing with John and his brothers and all, who appeared on the beach? And what did he tell them to do? Feed the flock. So Peter heard it from him firsthand. But of course, prior to Christ's ascension, that's what he said constantly. Go ye into all the nations and do what? Preach the gospel. Did they do that? Yes, they did. These men were very convicted. On both sides, isn't that funny? <laughs> They were convicted by man's law for doing it, but they were convicted that they had to partake of Christ's sufferings too. And then what? Then glory. We have it backwards, don't we? Well, we've been taught that, but then that's our own fault because we allowed ourselves to be taught that because it's easy, right? It says here, uh, Mrs. White says, God is not glorified by leaders in the church who seek to uh, drive the sheep. 
No, no. Feed the flock of God, which is among you. And I tell you, the best way to do that is to get people to work. That's how you learn. That's how you deal with problems and situations. But that's how you learn. You feed yourself at that point. Not so, Rodney. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but, by willing, but willingly, not by filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Do we have a lot of examples, I wonder? Every time I look, I don't like what I see. I wonder who de de designed that, that, that uh, book cover for Sons and Daughters of God and how much praise they got for that. I wonder who did that. Yeah, I got a picture of it in my phone. I'll show it to you. But I, I didn't really want to dwell on that. But the center of the picture is the Catholic priest and the nun. Jesus is under them, subservient. You know what they say about a picture speaks a thousand words. You look at that, and if you've got any savvy at all, you'll know exactly what's going on. It's amazing. There is a wide field for the elders and the helpers in every church. They are to feed the flock of God with pure provender or food, thoroughly winnowed from the chaff, the poisonous mixture of error. What is the job of the leaders? To filter out what? The garbage. Make sure this is not correct. This is not right. And would it also be part of the leadership to speak out against wrong? Absolutely. Regardless of the consequence. But then we have to learn from the master. We have to be as harmless as doves, but as wise as serpents. Rodney. Probably 30 or more years ago, the same thing happened that happened on that book was on the cover of the yearbook uh, at Andrews University. I don't know if you remember that or not. Nah, not really. But they had Catholic priests right on their I don't doubt yearbook, it, Rodney. right on their cover. Because you know why? They got Catholic priests teaching there. No, I don't remember that, but that's a fact. Yeah. Yeah, Cody. And you know, none of this stuff would happen if each and every one of us were doing the work. I think you mentioned that just about five minutes ago. That's the best yeah. way to turn a sinner into a true Christian is doing the work. Amen. I, I just heard a, the section from, from Mrs. White this week uh, where she, sa she stated, and it just hit me right between the eyes, that people don't learn how to swim on land. You learn how to swim <laughs> by getting the in the water. Yes. It's funny you bring that up because that's exactly how I learned to swim. My brother picked me up and threw me in a pond and said, swim or drown. <laughs> that's how I learned that. And I learned to doggy paddle. He, was, he wasn't going to let that happen. But he was tired of me not knowing how. He said, he took me out on the dock and, oh, look at the fish. And I went. He knew I knew. I, you know, I was just being lazy. Yeah, Cody. So in other words, if, you, if you're making an excuse as to why you're not doing some type of evangelism because you don't think you're good or you don't think you're effective, you just have to keep doing it yep. until you get effective. And you know what's amazing about what you just said? What is the most effective kind of evangelism for our time? We're told. What is it? Literature. Literature. What do you got to know? Nothing. Nothing. To drop off some books. You just have to be what? That's right. You just have to be what? Motivated. But it doesn't seem that the leadership and, and, and wants you to do that. But when they do, what do they do? They give you the books they want you to hand out. Go try and hand out a National Sunday Law book with their knowing it, or a secret terrorist, or who changed the Sabbath, or any of those. What will they do to you? Yep, they sell them. Yep, yep, yep. So she says here that the leadership is responsible for making sure there's no error in the food. You mean like changing the great controversy? You mean like putting that cover on, the, on, on sons and daughters of God? Interesting. You who have any part to act in the church of God, be sure that you act wisely in feeding the flock of God. 
for its uh, propensity uh, much or pro prosperity much depends upon the quality of the food. Another side note, do you see why the third angel's message and the health message cannot be separated? You cannot do that. It lies within the third angel's message, not separate from it. It becomes an apostate message if it is separated from it. And it distracts from the gospel if it is separated from it. Because it's the quality of the food, spiritually and physically, that develop a Christian to work. So, it's interesting. What was Christ's biggest issue with the church the first century? What was his big, the quality of the food? Wasn't it? The example that the leadership was giving. He said, listen to what they say because they're educated in that area, but don't do as they do because they're hypocrites. Matthew 23. And you know, folks, you better take, I better take Matthew 23 personally. Critique yourself along those lines that Jesus is saying, cursing against the wall when a curse or one and the same against the leadership. Because if we are a royal holy priesthood, we better make sure we have no qualities of that in our ministry. And then, what's the very next thing that comes in Matthew 24? Well, the end of 20, your house is left unto you desolate. And you can line that right up with the unpardonable sin. If in the judgment it comes up and it's said, they could say that about me, couldn't they? Your house is left unto you desolate. What would that mean on an individual? The Holy Spirit's withdrawn. You're done. Remember, that's the unpardonable sin. If the house is left, that, who's in charge of what goes on in the churches on earth? Who? The Holy Spirit. If that's withdrawn... I will come quickly and do what? What does it say? In Revelation, remove your candlestick and you'll what? Not know it. Who's in charge at that point? Lucifer. The food is extremely polluted. You're eating at McDonald's three times a day. No, I don't have any respect for McDonald's because they know full well what they're doing and it's by design. Let's go to... Um, well, now I want to read down to verse 6. So that was verse 3. So a big portion of what Peter is saying here that the leadership is to do is, number one, they have to be humble. Number two, they have, to, well, number one, they have to participate in this humility. Then they have to not lord over people, but guide. But the one thing that he points out here is to make sure that the message is straight and clear. The leadership is to filter out what? The garbage. See, the Pharisees got themselves lawyers and scribes to put the garbage in. Isn't that interesting? And what happened? They, missed, they didn't miss it. They didn't want it. Because there's an indictment against the leadership where in the gospel is there an indictment against them on that case? Where? Where do you find it? Very clearly. Where do you find it? What happened when a year and a half later, might have been a year within that period of time, wasn't quite two years, when the three Persians showed up in Herod's court? What happened? Herod ordered something. What was it? What was it? He said, I want to know where this Messiah is to come. So what did he order them to do? Research, study it. Did they find out? Yes, they knew it. They didn't want it. So when they say they didn't know or what, oh no, there's an indictment against the leadership. They didn't tell Herod. Isn't that interesting? Just like today, folks, just like today, but everybody was doing what they wanted. And who were they using? The people to accomplish their goals. Verse 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder. You are all 
uh, you, all of you, be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. How many times has Peter mentioned humility here? How many times has Peter mentioned humility here in these few verses? Referring to the leadership and then to whom? God's people. How many times? Yeah, past verse 3. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Let's go to uh, 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 Psalms 89. Now, David was one who knew how to be humble. Psalms 89, verse 14. David says here, Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before you. Mrs. White says, Justice has a twin sister that should ever stand by her side which is mercy and love. Now, if you're teaching falsehood, is that justice? Or is that evil? Or is that injustice? You cannot get justice out of a lie. If you're teaching truth, is that justice? Absolutely. And the interesting thing is, the truth that we don't want is full of mercy. The lie is full of death and deception that we do want, the lie that is. She goes on to say, let those who occupy positions of trust rid themselves of the unmerciful spirit which so greatly offends God. Were the Pharisees unmerciful? Could you describe them as that? Yes. How about the leadership of today's churches, both conference and independence? And I know there are those of you sitting here in independent church who felt the ire of the independent preacher. So are we merciful today? No. If you don't do what I say, what, what, what is the issue? What is it? You're out. Isn't that kind of like the blind man and his parents? Isn't that the same thing? Oh, well, we really don't know. You have to ask him. What was their reason for answering that way? They were afraid of the ire of the priests. These are supposed to be Christ's representatives? Where's the humility? Where's the justice? Where's the mercy? This is a man who, while he was hanging on the cross, as Samuel pointed out, looked down and said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Really? Now, let me show you the transition from Phariseeism to Christianity from Adventism to true Christianity. And when I say that, I'm talking about the formal Adventism. You understand that, correct? Peter cursed to prove he had nothing to do with Christ. At, and today, that's nothing to us, because everybody, but back then it was a big deal. You could have been punished for that by the church. To prove he had nothing to do with Christ. But then, after he was converted, what did he say? Don't crucify me the way my, my, my Lord was crucified. Turn me upside down. Do you see the difference? Earthly comfort had no place in his life. But then in Jesus' life, did it have a place? Because you see, there's a conflict. These little trinkets that the devil gives us that we think we own, like people, if you think you own your house, don't pay your taxes and see what happens. You rent it from the government. I don't care where you live in this country. You rent, it's not yours. The Founding Fathers would start a revolution over property tax if they were here. Because that was one of the basic rights of an American, is to own your property and nobody could take it away. Was that also supposed to be the same in Israel when it was founded? You couldn't even sell it, because after so many years, what would happen? It would revert back to the family. So that was a godly principle, wasn't it? So. Most of us have car payments. It's my car, don't make that payment. What happens? Whose car is it? And you know, it's amazing that they've got it worked out to where when them payments stop, what happens to that car? 
No, it stops working. Have you noticed that? Today. Yeah, today you have this problem, that problem. Oh, well, you just trade it in and get a new loan. You see? So, I mean, you know. God's justice and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Let no one suppose that God has given to man the power of ruling fellow men. What does it say in Jeremiah 31 about the New Deal? Man shall not teach man. Isn't that what it says? I shall write my laws where? Upon their mind and heart. Who is taking possession? He will accept the service of no man who hurts and discourages Christ's heritage. Now is the time for every man to examine himself, to prove himself, that he may see whether he is in the faith. Hmm. Investigate closely the motives which prompt you to action. We are engaged in the work of the uh, what we are engaged in the work of the Most High. Let us not wave, waver into the web of our, uh, weave into the web of our work one thread of selfishness. Well, that's why Peter said he witnessed Christ's sufferings. Was there any selfishness in Christ's sufferings? Let us raise to the higher plane. Let us rise to a higher plane in our daily experience. God will not serve with the sins of any man. That means woman, too, in today's vernacular. It means mankind. And there, when you take the word, and this is the reason why, you ever wonder why they want no separation between man and woman? Oh, it's all the same. No, it's not. It's mankind. And when you recognize that, there are no races. Think about it. Man and his kind. How do you have different races out of that? You don't. So they can't use the racism to divide, if you understand biblically that. Folks, there's your investigative judgment. I just read it. And how does it go on? She said, investigate closely the motives which prompt you to action. And what do they have to be in line with? Every day. Every day. So I tell you, and I'm putting this to you, biblically and from the spirit of, the investigative judgment takes place as long as I draw breath. When that stops, guess what? Unless I turn around and say, I don't want anything to do with it. Get away from me with this stuff. What have you just done? You've pushed the Holy Spirit away. Unpardonable sin. Then your mind is left to darkness, as Paul says. He also says in Hebrews that there is not a constant stream of blood for those who continually sin. There no longer remains a sacrifice for those who willfully sin. Isn't that what he says? So really, the investigative judgment is a simple thing. And one, it falls on preachers and leaders first. It's how we accept the Holy Spirit into our life. It's that simple. That determines. Do you really believe that once you've done that completely that you're going to hell? Think about it. It's impossible. Then God's a liar. And the devil's correct. There is no way to overcome. So it's easier to teach people, you can sin and go to heaven, rather than, no, you have to live biblically. And that's what the leaders have to be telling you. See why they got to get rid of the spirit of prophecy? Because it makes it very plain and simple. We follow no man. Leaders are here to do what? To direct, to make sure that everything remains faithful to God. That's what Jesus came for. He didn't order people around. He didn't change anything, did he? He just pointed people to what? The Bible, to his Father, to the Holy Spirit. That's what he did. He changed nothing other than the way business was done in the church, which we have to pick up and run with. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you again for the simplicity of your word, and we praise you, Father, for the spirit of prophecy for that humble little lady, Father, who was willing to allow her pen to be used by your Holy Spirit. Father, be with us. There are tricky times we're in. 
And the only way to survive them is to allow your spirit to lead us, your son to cleanse us, and your grace to pardon us. Be with us, Father. Help us to get this work done. Help us to be humble and meek and to seek to lord over no one and always to stand for truth, and that's going to take some doing. Be with us that we may overcome. In Jesus' name, amen.